Uh, let us uh, stand in honor of God's Word, which comes from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, verses 12 through 14. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these amazing words that came from the lips of our Lord Jesus. And Lord, they are important words for us as your church. And I ask that you would anoint me with your Holy Spirit in sharing what Jesus intends and wishes for his people, for the church. And Lord, I pray that you'd increase our faith and help us to live, live it out in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned, it was a highlight for us to finally, once again, be gathered together as a family. Family reunions, they're very, very rich, and they're very wonderful. And I think it's almost a little foretaste of what the Lord has for all of His people at the end of the age. Because at the end of the age, the Lord Jesus will return back to the earth and he will gather all of his redeemed sons and daughters from every nation and every people group. And he will gather them together like a family. And there will be a reunion of all the saints throughout all the ages. And it's going to be simply amazing. Now friends, before that happens, the Lord wants a big family. He wants to increase the size of that family. He wants to invite those that are presently on the outside and give them the, the choice to come on in and experience the kingdom of God and join God's redeemed family. And this passage today, I believe, is an important part of God's plan for His church. I've entitled the message this morning, Aspiring to Jesus' Wishes. What does the Lord Jesus want from His people, from the church, from the redeemed people of God? Well, these three verses here are among some of the most amazing promises you will see in the Gospels. I want us to take a good look at them. Because I think the first thing when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Think what Jesus is just saying to his disciples there. And by inference, to all of us as followers of Jesus. Jesus intends and wants to multiply his ministry on the earth. And he wants to do it through you and me as amazing as that sounds. And he's made a provision for it. Well, what had Jesus been doing? You know, preaching, teaching, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. You mean to tell me that he intends for us to do those kinds of things? Yes. It's true which goes to show you how after a while we sort of go on cruise control and, and sort of ignore the challenging passages like this. 
But the Lord intends to reveal His glory to His people. And He wants to multiply the ministry through His body all over the earth. And I believe the Lord's doing that more and more as revival fires spread throughout the whole earth. It's like the body of Christ is finally coming into all that, he, that Jesus intended for the body to be and to do. I think if you look at church history, you see that there are phases where amazing things are happening among God's people. And then the enemy comes in and replaces those exciting things with a thing called religion, which is something that's sort of man-made and more about control and more about you know, keeping things under control, keeping things with good dignity, so on and so forth. And the enemy sort of shuts down the supernatural part of being a Christian, the supernatural living out of the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. The Holy Spirit, though, does not give up. He continues to work through a small group through that remnant who will take the Scriptures at face value and believe the Lord for more. And so there have been times in history where there's been renewal movements and a rediscovery of the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of what God wants to do. The enemy at the same time will sow a lot of confusion in times like that. We always have to be discerning, go back to God's Word to see what, what really is and how that should look. But getting back to this, Whenever Jesus starts out anything He wants us to pay special attention to, He'll say, and, and as the NIV says, I tell you the truth. In the Greek, it's amen, amen, lego, humin. And it's literally, so be it, so be it, I say unto you. It's a little bit like in German where you say, achtung, you know, attention. Don't miss what I'm going to say right now because it's too important to miss it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, I tell you the truth. And then what follows is amazing. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. But we'll get to that in a minute. Who can do the things that Jesus did according to this passage? The apostles, those 12 men that were chosen, yes, but not just the apostles. Okay? Those that have been seminary trained and ordained as clergy, yes, it should be, but not just the clergy. Okay, what is the Lord saying here? Those who are super spiritual, who know the Bible so well that they can articulate it clearly. Not, yes, but not just those. It says, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Any follower of Jesus as Lord and Messiah who looks to Him in faith and trusts His Word and is filled with His Holy Spirit will do the things that Jesus did. This is one of the most radical passages in the Gospel. And the reason it's radical is because so few of us are living it out. It's not because it's not true. It's because we've lacked the faith to step into it most of the time. What can they do? The things that Jesus did in His earthly ministry those three and a half years. What specific kinds of things did Jesus do? If we look to a couple of summary passages, Mark 1, 14-15. After John, who would be John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. 
The first thing we can all do is proclaim the truth of God's kingdom. That God indeed reigns and that His reign and rule is coming to the earth. We do this through teaching, through preaching, through song, through dance. There's a lot of ways to proclaim God's kingdom. But it doesn't just stop there. Because, you know, there are kingdom claims made by the Lord Jesus which are astounding. And He did more than simply teach and preach on the kingdom of God. He also demonstrated its reality through signs and wonders and miracles. Matthew 4, 23-25, another summary statement. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. Did you ever see that before? News about Jesus spread all over Syria. Well, what did the Syrians know about God? They weren't part of God's people, but the news spread. And friends, the news isn't going to spread if just a man is walking around preaching and teaching. Here's why the news spread. He healed every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, and the demon-possessed. Literally in the Greek, the demonized. Those that were so under the influence of the devil, that were so filled with demons, that they had no control over their thinking and their behavior. Are there demonized people today? Most certainly are, all over in every culture. Those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. You see, Jesus didn't just say the kingdom of God is here. He said the kingdom of God is here, and then he confirmed it by doing something about people's bondage, setting people free from demons, and healing people just about every condition imaginable. How did He do that? In the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was a way of saying, yes, the kingdom's coming. The kingdom's here in the person and presence of the Lord Jesus. And it's breaking into this present reality and it's changing everything. The result? Large crowds from Galilee the Decapolis. Now again, the Decapolis is not a part of uh, God's people. Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Yes, people were beginning to follow him from all over the region. Proclamation and demonstration. Proclaiming the truth of God's Word and then confirming it in the power of the Holy Spirit by signs, wonders, and miracles. That's the ministry of Jesus in a nutshell. It's not one or the other, it's both friends. And the early church experienced this same phenomenon. And throughout history, there have been remnants that have continued to operate in the fullness of Jesus' ministry. And more and more, the body of Christ is reawakening to the fullness and stepping into more of the supernatural. And this is good and this is needed. Praise the Lord for that. You see, signs and wonders confirm the truth of God's Word. It's like a stamp of approval. It's like a way of saying, yes, we can back the truth of what we proclaim. And we don't back it. It's God Himself that backs it. But it only happens if we as His people will step in faith and begin to pray for healing and look to God to step in and do what He wants to do through His people. And that takes faith. And that also means, in a sense, saying no to the man-made limits that we've put on 
the Lord and that we've put on ourselves because of wrong understandings. Jesus was powerful in word and in deed. And the early church was likewise powerful in word and deed. And God wants the English language congregation of the NEC here in Bahrain to be powerful in word and deed, friends. I want us to... uh, I, I plan to go through the book of Acts in this next year because I want us to get a vision for what the church originally was so that we don't get lost just in the evolution of what has happened in our history, but that we go back to see what it was fresh off the lips of Jesus and from the apostles. See what the Lord did. The the book of Acts is really about the acts of the Holy Spirit through His church. And so I'm I'm excited uh, about what's coming. Friends, the world needs to see the reality of God's reign and rule. They need to see that God is who Jesus says He is. The Son of God. The Son of Man. The Savior of the world. The King of glory. Great claims. And He wants to show it as He stretches out His arm powerfully and signs, wonders, and miracles Through His people. That's what He wants to do. So first and foremost, Jesus wants to multiply His ministry through His body, the church. Secondly, Jesus wants to empower us for supernatural ministry so that we can do that. Uh, John 14, 13, Jesus again says, And I will do whatever you ask in My name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. We are to ask in the mighty name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful because the name of Jesus, Jesus is the name which is above all names. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It is by the name of Jesus that Satan has to back off and yield. It is by the name of Jesus that demons will flee. It is by the name of Jesus that healings and other signs and wonders and miracles occur. And yes, there are even some who have been raising the dead in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. And when Jesus is pleased to do it through us, why? So that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Now, amazingly, I'm convinced that Satan has deceived the church into thinking, we can't do those things. We, it would bring glory to ourselves. No, that misses the whole point. It brings glory to the Lord when He's able to do signs, wonders, and miracles through His people. He gets the glory. And the Son wants to continue the same ministry He had on the earth through His people. That's why He said, it's good for you that I'm going away. Because if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit won't come on you. And I want the Holy Spirit to come on you so that you have some of Jesus in you that you'll do the same things I did, and I'm going to be up there interceding on your behalf. It's good that I'm going away, he says. Jesus lived his whole life to glorify God the Father. And he still wants to glorify God the Father by carrying on the same ministry through his body, the church, today. And he does that through his Holy Spirit working in the church. He wants us to bear lots of fruit. He he doesn't want us to think small and be satisfied with little. How do I know that? Well, a chapter later, John 15. Jesus, we have the recording about how Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And 
Apart from me, you can't do anything, but when you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I, I want us to be honest. I'm convinced as I go around speaking to supporting churches, there are a lot of churches all over the world that live with very little faith and expectation for God to do much. Isn't that true? We, you know, we, we've moved away from the supernatural into very much the natural. And then we ask God to bless what we're doing so we can tweak it and do it a little bit better. But we're missing the point here. God wants us to believe Him for the power of His Holy Spirit and the supernatural to flow in and through us so that the world can see that God is real. It's not about us. It's about God working through His people. And it's a radical message, but an important one. And as I said, it's radical because we're, we're not doing a good job of stepping into it. When we step into it and see it, then we'll say, aha, Lord, Your Word really is true. You confirm the truth of Your Word. And we thank You. And suddenly, the Christian life is a whole lot more exciting than perhaps where we've been for years. It's easy to slip back into the natural. Now, Jesus goes on and says, If you remain in Me and My words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You see, in a sense, the Lord wants to show off His power, His wisdom, His grace through His people. Through the Holy Spirit working through His people. He wants to show off. And when we do these things, it's evidence that we're really His followers. It's amazing. What kind of fruit? We want to bear much fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, I think three kinds of fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. The character of Jesus. That means that supernatural love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Something the world needs to see in us. And we need that supernatural fruit of the Spirit, which is an evidence that the Holy Spirit's really at work changing us to come out. We need to bear that kind of fruit. Secondly, I think it's the fruit of good works. Being a blessing to hurting and needy people, especially the poor, orphans and widows, those who are most vulnerable, victims of injustice. The Lord wants us to care with His compassion, the fruit of good works. I think thirdly, the fruit of evangelism. Sharing Jesus with others. Inviting them into the kingdom. Inviting them to experience the kingdom and become followers of Jesus themselves. He wants us to bear much fruit. Jesus gives us some amazing promises. If we believe, we can do what Jesus did. The only requirement, friends, is faith in Him. Faith in Him, if we'll believe Him for what He says. And He even challenges us, He challenges His disciples, He says, and He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What does it mean? How could we do greater things than Jesus did when He was on the earth? How? I think for one he, he plans that the impact will be much broader. And that, and that the very things he was doing in Israel, primarily among the Jews, would be done among all the people groups in the world. You'll do even greater things than these because you'll go to remote places where they know nothing about God and you'll introduce them to the one true God. And they'll see that the name of Jesus has power. And that Jesus is the Son of God. That He is the Savior of the world. And they'll become followers of this same Jesus. I also think 
that the Lord intends a great outpouring of his Holy Spirit at the end of the age, just before he returns. He's going to come back to a glorious church that's finally living out what the Lord intended all along and more of what we saw at the very beginning before we were muddled in history by a lot of confusion and unbiblical practice. Now, why is it important that Jesus is going to the Father? I think I mentioned it. Because Jesus lives to intercede for us even now. Can you imagine that while we're down here struggling with the challenges of life on earth, and they are many, Jesus is actually sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us. He's pleading for us. That's why we need to ask in his name and look to him. And he'll actually be our advocate with the Father. It's an amazing promise. But there is an important qualification, and I want to kind of get at that. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. There's another passage in 1 John 5, and I think it's a good qualification. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, he hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. According to His will is an important qualification. You see, when Jesus said this to His disciples, He was assuming that they were walking with Him. That they were in genuine relationship with Him. That they lived to please the Savior. That they wouldn't ask for foolish and fleshy kinds of things. You know what I mean. You know, Lord, I want a new car. Lord, would you you got to give me a new car. Give me that new car. Lord, I expect that new car. Not that a new car is a bad thing. But it's like when you walk with God, you, you, you start caring about the things that are a priority, that are more important than the new car. And maybe He can then maybe you can then become satisfied with the car that you do have. And instead, you're caring about the things that are on the heart of God. According to His will. We begin to see things as we walk with the Lord. We see things from His perspective. We get more of His heart. We take on His character and His values and His priorities. If we're honest about our prayer life, I have to say that Sometimes our prayer life hasn't been very effective or inspiring. And I, I, I admit this about my own prayer life. Because some of us have just learned to take all of our felt needs to God like a grocery list. You know, Lord, here's what I need, as if the Lord doesn't know it Himself. Okay? And some of us... What we do is we start focusing on our problems and then we get before God and moan and groan and complain. I mean, let's be honest. It's not inspiring and it's not effective. I have been reading a very challenging book called Fresh Encounters by Daniel Henderson. And what they're, what they're doing, this movement is doing is producing a new model for praying. It's more biblical and balanced. And I like it. It's called worship-based prayer. Where you first worship God, come into His presence. It involves spontaneous, Holy Spirit-guided, um, spontaneous reading of Scripture where the Lord leads you to certain passages and you read that before the group. And then you pray that out. So that you're praying the things that the Lord cares about. And you're getting an idea of what He wants. And you're praying according to that. Instead of focusing on our problems and felt needs, it focuses on the greatness and the glory of our God and on His character. Worship-based prayer. It involves spontaneous use of Scripture, which helps to build our faith so that when we pray, we'll believe. And that's so critical. 
and we'll pray according to His will as we hear more from the Holy Spirit and listen to His voice in the worship time. Think how many times in the book of Acts where the church is gathered in prayer, corporate prayer, and they're praying together. And it's in that context that the Lord gives strategy. That the Lord says, okay, I want you to to, uh, lay your hands on Paul and Barnabas and send them out. Well, they didn't have any idea that they were going to do that. They were led by the Holy Spirit in the context of the worship to do that. So they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and they became powerful missionaries in the region. And so on and so forth. That's just one example. I want to encourage us. Join me on this journey to pray in a different way. Worship-based prayer. I want to teach on this. I want us to do it together. I want us to learn together. Our prayer time shouldn't be a grocery list of felt needs and problems, but rather a celebration of the glory and greatness of God and what He wants to do through His people, through you and me. This is why the Apostle Paul, as he's writing his letter to the Ephesian Christians, could give a benediction like this. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what the Lord is going to show us in and through His Word. I want to challenge us. This next Friday, the ELC board members had decided before uh, I left for our summer break that when we returned on the um, 14th, we are going to have a day of fasting and prayer to get God's vision for the English language congregation of the NEC. I'm going to, I've, I'm asking our board members, each and every one of the 10 of us, while well, counting me 11, we're going to fast and pray. And we're going to ask the Lord to give us His strategy and His heart for what He wants in the next year. But I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to fast and pray and support that vision? Because we need to, as a body, come together, look to Him, get our marching orders from heaven, and then lay out some plans. Lay out a budget, so on and so forth. Would you be will- How many of you would be willing to do this? Praise God. I'm going to just encourage all of you to step out in faith. If you can't fast a whole day, then fast one meal. Okay, and if you and if fasting is extremely difficult, do a juice fast, but do something because the Lord honors the sacrifice. That's the key. It's our way of prostrating ourselves before God and saying, "Lord, we don't want to just live in our power. We want Your plans. We want Your power. We need You." And so we'll go without food and we'll suffer a little bit in order to sacrifice, to receive more from you. I'm going to ask you to pray for me as your pastor to have a special anointing of the Holy Spirit as we go through the book of Acts in this next year. That the Lord will show all He wants us to see so that we can be equipped as His people and He can use us in a more powerful way in the future. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we give You thanks and praise for these amazing words of Jesus. Lord, they're amazing. But what is more amazing is when we live this out. These are the aspiring words of Jesus 
that he has for us, the body of Christ, God's people, followers of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd increase our faith and help us to believe and step out in faith, looking to you for the kind of power that is being reflected in these words. That we would do the things that Jesus did, that the world may know and believe that we have been sent by you. We want to see more of Jesus in and through us. We want to see his Holy Spirit powerfully move among us as his people. And we ask for that. We pray that your kingdom would come, O Lord, that your will would be done in and through us in this upcoming year. Lord, help us to be more of what you intended from the very beginning. That when people are among us, they'll say, surely God is among you. May Jesus be glorified. May the Father be glorified in and through us in the upcoming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.